Hi, so I'm Grace Nats. I'm a 14 year old climate activist here on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen and the Wasanich speaking peoples. Uh, yeah, I've been involved in the BC Greens since I was about fourth, since I was in fourth grade, so I was about nine years old. And that is 100% because in around the middle of the school year, Sonia actually came to speak to our class. And she came to us and she told us about the Site C Dam and what was currently happening in, in the Peace River region. And personally, I was absolutely disgusted as a nine-year-old thinking, why would they destroy this land that they don't even have permission to take? And I was so upset after that talk that I had to come talk to Son Sonia. And she assured me that I could make the change I wanted to see in the world, regardless of whatever adults said or how ridiculous and big my dreams were. And I came out of that talk being like, okay, how can I get involved in the BC Greens? How can I make change? And five years later, I'm a climate activist here in Victoria, and I am proud to say that my climate activist group has mobilized over 20,000 people last September. And we are fighting for the climate justice that is intersectional and that is equitable for all. Thank you, Grace. And over to you, Harrison. Uh, hi, my name is Harrison Johnston. I'm speaking today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, colonially known as North Vancouver. Uh, giving a land acknowledgement is often just a formality for people, um, but I think that it's vital that we recognize the ongoing effects of colonialism here in British Columbia. The results of the 2020 Metro Vancouver homeless count were recently released, and it found that while Indigenous people make up 2.5% of Metro Vancouver's population, they are 33% of the homeless population. We need to be taking action to decolonize our society and to end the oppression of Indigenous people and communities. Uh, now, as a young person in BC, uh, I am part of the most underrepresented group in our legislature. BC's youngest MLA is currently 35 years old, and that leaves the youngest 40% of British Columbians without a single representative. That's more than 1.8 million people without a single voice in our government who truly understands the struggles we're facing. We are underrepresented and tokenized at every level of government in Canada. And this has clear effects on the policy decisions that are made, especially in our modern world, which is changing so rapidly. We simply cannot expect politicians who grew up in a completely different reality to properly represent young people. In BC, youth are facing many crises. We are getting closer and closer to climate catastrophe, and yet our government is doubling down on LNG and old growth logging. Housing is becoming more and more unaffordable. The homeless population is continuing to increase. We're seeing record, record numbers of overdose deaths. And yet our politicians don't seem to want to listen to the young people who are asking for common sense solutions. Last year, I had a meeting with BC's Minister of the Environment, along with two of my fellow youth. He ended up avoiding most of our questions and then made sure to take a selfie with us at the end so he could share it on his social media and show that he was listening to young people. Uh, we ended up meeting with Sonia a few months later to ask for her advice, and it really stood out to me that she treated us as equals. She wanted to listen to us. She wanted to listen to what we had to say, and she was very open and honest. When she called me to ask for my support for her leadership bid, it was a very easy decision. Thanks. Yeah, I have to say Harrison made some excellent points about land acknowledgements. And I'd like to say that currently, specifically in my age group and a lot of others, land acknowledgements and indigenous rights seem to be seen as this sort of trend or a headline that is only, it only matters when it is being shown. And the biggest example of this is back in January when the Indigenous youth were occupying the legislature for over a week and that got headlines. However, Wet'suwet'en rights are still being infringed currently and recently Coastal Gaslink just got the green light to continue to build on their lands without consent. Not only does this directly violate UNDRIP, there is no media coverage of this still. This is still happening and it still has to be said. Thank you, Grace, and thank you, Harrison, for joining us tonight, and thank you for your fantastic introductions. I um, have, of course, been following both of you and admiring your work and your capacity to articulate so clearly what really matters for, you, for youth 
and in fact for all of us and this is this is what i think we make the mistake of thinking that youth are only advocating for themselves the youth are, are the only ones in my point of view that are currently advocating for everybody and so i'm delighted that you've both joined us tonight and i'm uh i'm actually quite in awe that you're you're part of the campaign and that you've uh, been such a such important uh, parts of this campaign and I'm so grateful. I'm also on the territory of the Lokwongan speaking people. Uh, I'm in a hotel in Victoria. It's our last day of the legislative session tomorrow. But typically I am uh, on Coast Salish lands and in, in the territories of the Cowichan and the Malahat First Nations. Uh, and just like what Harrison and Grace talked about, you know, I, I, it was maybe four years ago that I, I actually uh, wrote a bit of a speech that I was, when I did a land acknowledgement to kind of dig into that land acknowledgement a bit more because often we, we say it and then we move on. And I think that uh, there's a risk of that, of, of thinking that, okay, we've, we've performed that task and now we move on to the, the real work. Um, and the land acknowledgement should be should be something that reminds us of the history of of where we are but also the reality of today and in Cowichan you know it became so clear that what people think of as history which is the removal of indigenous children and we think of the residential school era as this real black mark on Canadian history uh, it was so shocking for me to to discover and then have so much personal interactions with families who are experiencing this right now. And the, the rate of removal of indigenous children from families is the same as it was during the residential school era. And this is, this is a, 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 a part, when I do an, a land acknowledgement, it's, it's, for me, it reminds me of the fact that this injustice remains very much a fabric of our, of our Canadian society. And we have a lot of work to do to get past it. And, uh, and so, uh, that's a, we wanted to be able to reflect a little bit more deeply on the land acknowledgement piece. I'm going to hand it back over to Grace for a moment and then we'll come back around. Yeah, I think I was definitely just as shocked to learn that statistic specifically about residential schools. And like you said, we learn in our school system that this happened, but it's okay because the prime minister apologized and that makes everything better. And that is what I was taught. And that is probably what I genuinely believed for many years. I just thought, oh, it was too long ago to matter anymore. It's still completely fine. He apologized. It's all good. However, it's so systemic and deeply rooted in our society. Like what Harrison said with the disproportionate rate of indigenous people that are currently homeless, then we have to make systemic change. We can't just apologize and pat indigenous people on the back and say we're good. There are so many deeply rooted issues across our society. Everything changes, everything must change and we have to decolonize every single part of BC and of Canada. Uh, yeah, adding on to that, definitely. I've seen uh, in sort of the past couple years that I've been doing a lot of activism in BC, um, just how, how interesting this relationship is between uh, government and activists and the indigenous activists who are really leading on almost everything. Um, and there's sort of been a shift in the youth climate movement that I've been a part of to move from it being this idea of it being led mostly by white privileged youth to really following the lead of indigenous voices. And uh, then also seeing that while we're these young youth are making this shift, pretty much every other area of society isn't making this shift, isn't really um, getting this idea that we are on indigenous land, they are the stewards of this land, we should be following their lead. Um, so yeah, I think there are really important discussions to be had. So I'm just gonna, uh, we're gonna get to the questions uh, from that were submitted in just a moment, but I just wanted to tell a really short story. In, and when I was a teacher, I always used to say to my students, hey, is it story time? And my students, yay, story time. <laughs> um, because some of the, for me, stories really uh, are effective in illustrating, um, illustrating things. So when I was in grade 11, um, 
I had gone to a, a I'd gone from grade nine in Alberta's junior high school, so it was seven, eight, nine, and had a, had a great experience at junior high, a really close knit community. And then I went off to about half of us went to one high school and half of us went to another high school. And I went, I chose the big high school. It's called Harry Inley. And it was the, at the time, it was the largest school in Western Canada. And, and I did not do well there. I really struggled um, having felt a kind of a loss of sense of community and connection, both with other students and with teachers. And so the next year I switched over to the other high school in Edmonton that was in the catchment area I was in, which was uh, Strathcona. And at Strathcona, I, I, by then I'd gotten a little surly and I, I was uh, the kid at the back of the class sort of with my arms crossed and, and a, a little bit a little bit of an attitude, <laughs> but uh, there was Mr. McNam, and he was my grade 11 social studies teacher. And I don't know what it was that Mr. McNab recognized or saw, but he decided that uh, he wanted to open, open some doorways for me and, and provide me with some opportunities. And uh, I was able to apply to go to young parliamentarians in Ottawa because of Mr. McNab. He really encouraged me to apply. And I was able to go spend a week in Ottawa at the parliament and, and meet MPs and get a sense of that. The really tragic piece of that was my MP at the time, because I lived on an acreage, was Joe Clark, <laughs> uh, who was the, the leader of the official opposition uh, when I went. And I was, I was uh, scheduled to go meet with him, but the days were so long and, and complicated, I fell asleep on the bus and nobody woke me up. So I missed my meeting with Joe Clark. <laughs> And then Mr. McNabb also encouraged me to do Model UN and I went to the, the Summer Institute for Model UN. I spent 10 days in Rocky Mountain House with observers from the United Nations and I, I, I you know, we spent a week in debates at Model UN. And I'm so grateful to Mr. McNabb for, for seeing that spark, for seeing that behind that surly, arms crossed teenager at the back of the room, there was somebody who was really interested in the world around her and really interested in, in wanting to be part of something. Um, uh, sorry, I just noticed that the sound level is low. I've tried to turn it up. Uh, and I think what I learned from Mr. McNabb was that, that as an adult and as a teacher and now as an MLA, I look for that spark in young people and it is so easy to find. It's, it's right there. It's often right below the surface, if not shining through immediately. And in these two, it's definitely shining through. You can see the spark. And I've really made it a, a, a commitment as an adult in, in all the things I do to, to, to light those sparks, to, to find ways to open doors, to, to create opportunities and, and to, to engage and to be engaged with young people. And I'm really grateful to Ms. McNabb, not just for seeing that in me, but for teaching me that as an adult, it is so essential that we, we see young people as the full, amazing, complete people that they are, and that they have just as much, if not more, to contribute. Uh, and we, oh, we, over, we underestimate them as a society, but I'm, I'm determined uh, not to do that. And so that's just a little story from my, from my youth and, and part of what informs how I've approached my adulthood and this role. I've had uh, 35 youth shadow me over the last three years at the BC legislature. So including two in the last three weeks, which is great. All right, so uh, we're gonna move to the Q&A part. And I think, uh, Grace, you're gonna ask the first question. Yeah, so the first question is actually quite close to me because it's a question about the first issue that actually got me involved in politics. And of course, so the question is, do you think it is within the realm of possibility to prevent sightsee? And if so, how, if not, why not? And personally, obviously, like the story I told before, when Sonia came and told me about the Sightsee Dam, I was absolutely horrified. And I didn't realize that this kind of stuff was happening on such a larger scale across the entire planet. And now more than ever, we are at a time where we can make these changes. We just have to figure out how. Sonia? 
Thanks, Grace. And, and obviously this question is, is really important to us and it's, it's very relevant right now because of the report that came out from BC Hydro to, to BCUC. And I, I just want to make sure, I, I noticed that Cheryl said the sound level is not working. If, it, if other people are having trouble hearing me, please let me know and I'll go get some headphones and, and stick those in. I'm trying to be as loud as I can. Um, so the report from BC Hydro to BCUC that came out just a few weeks ago uh, really detailed a lot of what had already been identified as problems at the Site C uh, site. And the, the one in particular is, uh, is the geotechnical issues that, and I read the report, uh, the, the way that BC Hydro uh, says it is, the geotechnical issues materialized at the site. And I always think like that's, language is very interesting, right? It's like, we don't know where they came from. It's like a ghost. It just materialized at the site. Um, they didn't materialize at the site. That These problems had been identified. Uh, and what is happening is the, the deeper they get into the construction, the more it's becoming clear that those geotechnical issues are uh, big, big, big problems. And there are reports from on the ground that what we got in that report doesn't even encompass the, the depth of the, the geotechnical issues. And uh, it brings to mind, uh, you know, this question was put, I was with uh, Grand Chief um, Stuart Phillip and he was asked about, uh, he was asked about Site C and he, 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 in his wonderful humorous kind of way that he has, he said, Oh, Mother Nature is fighting back against Site C. I believe in Mother Nature. And I think that we can see these geotechnical issues really are, uh, geo they are Mother Nature. Uh, I, I do a cartoon every day, and that was my cartoon yesterday, it was Mother Nature. Um, and uh, so the, the report identifies that not only do, does BC Hydro and the, the construction uh, contractors up there don't know the extent of the issues or the solutions, exactly how they're going to be solved, but how much that would cost. And so we are back in a very crucial decision point, from my point of view, vis-a-vis -vis Site C. Uh, because what the government's decision is right now is, do they proceed with this project with an unknown price tag attached to it? And, and that's not even measuring uh, what we all agree are the, the, the deep-seated problems with Site C. As Grace says, you know, this is unceded territory. Well, it's, it's Treaty 8 territory, but the, the, the nations were not in favor of it. Um, this is land that will be flooded that is some of the best agricultural land in British Columbia. This is um, ecological impacts uh, to a river that is uh, essential to the well-being of the of the wider region a region that is already so deeply impacted by industrial activity um, you know the blueberry eight uh, the blueberry first nation has a, a case in the courts right now because there's no single square kilometer of their territory that doesn't have some kind of industrial impact on it and so, what are we doing? Adam and I have, uh, have obviously spoken out quite a bit on this. We've also put the question uh, both on Tuesday and Wednesday to the minister. And I will point out today that uh, the BC Liberals also asked a question uh, about Site C and pointed out that from their point of view, this does look like it's becoming a fiscally irresponsible uh, a place or potentially. And I think that uh, this is important that we have to be able to stop these, uh, these kind of camps that we operate in politically. And we have to start finding common ground across all of our political, uh, all of our political parties. And on issues like this, we have to be able to have adult conversations about what is best for the province and the, the financial risk now, when you look at Muskrat Falls and the impact that that has had on, uh, on Newfoundland's uh, overall finances, it is devastating. And we, we don't need a crystal ball to look ahead to look at the, the devastating impact. So we are pushing um, and we're gonna continue to push 
And I think that, uh, you know, there's an opportunity right now for this uh, to, to go in the right direction, which is the, the, the end of this, uh, the end of this dam. Uh, so another question, which is kind of a perfect follow-up from that. Uh, if we are able to cancel Site C, what is your vision to replace all the energy that will be needed to electrify our province with clean energy? Bill 17 looked like it was, going, it was created to buy cheap, clean power from California to help offset the burgeoning cost overruns of Site C. Since the Greens didn't support that bill uh, and the bill died, what happens next? So it's a great question, and and part of the, the the I can I can give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain into the the, the conversations and the effort that went into our caucus uh, our caucus's position on Bill Seventeen, and it was not insignificant. We we had a lot of meetings with uh, both within our caucus. We had a lot of meetings with people. Uh, with First Nations, with experts on energy policy, with uh, BC Clean Energy, um, and we had lots of meetings with staff and and minister. Um, and so it wasn't a you know a, a small decision for us to to indicate that we wouldn't support that bill. But the for for there were two real driving issues for us. One, the lack of consultation with First Nations that we passed the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the fall. And this is our first real session after passing that legislation to show that that legislation means something, that we're going to be different because of that legislation, that we're going to govern differently in light of adopting the Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And for Adam and, and myself, it was very challenging to, to hear from so many First Nations uh, and organizations representing First Nations, uh, particularly invested in energy, that they hadn't, they hadn't been consulted. And so that was a, that was a, I, I vividly remember, uh, it was a Sunday night, maybe three weeks ago, uh, getting ready, packed up to, to come down to the legislature the next morning and, and really having that sense of, of a solid and core place of, of where I was at on this and that if this is what we do after UNDRIP, this isn't good enough. And it, it, this is the time when we kind of set the direction of whether that legislation means anything. And I, I wasn't willing to say, well, we'll let this one go and we'll let the next one go and maybe we'll do better next time. I, w I just wasn't really willing to say that. So that was number one. Number two is the question that, that is framed in this, which is what is the vision for energy in the province? And the BCUC report in 2017 really clearly indicated that uh, we could have generated the same energy at the same or lower cost to Site C just with wind and solar. And I know that in Tumblr Ridge, they had a wind project lined up, ready to go. They had the investors, uh, they already have a, a, a wind industry up in Tumblr Ridge. They could have produced 70% of Site C's energy at Tumblr Ridge. Uh, and as soon as Site C was approved, those investors left and there was no energy, you know, no new wind energy coming in, uh, no new work opportunities, uh, job opportunities. And the, the, the great thing about the Tumblr Ridge model is it is, again, in conjunction with the First Nations out there. And so the question that we that really does need to be our guiding question on this is what where do we want to end up as an energy uh, uh, from an energy point of view for the province? And for me, and I've been I've been asking the experts that we talk to, I've been asking people that that can can give me you know informed answers on this. And they they are they are confirming that we could strive for a kind of regional energy resilience approach to how we're going to do clean energy in the province. And so if we started to take different regions of the province and look at the different potentials for clean energy in those regions, so in the Northwest, there's huge potential for, for geothermal. It is un largely untapped. And the same as in the Northeast, but there's the wind in the Northeast. Obviously in the center of the province, solar potential is enormous. There's wave potential. Um, but what we are doing with the current approach is we are tamping down the possibility 
for the innovation and for the building of this uh, kind of regional clean energy uh, structure for the province because we put all our all of our chips onto currently onto site C and that really sent this this signal and so again there's this opportunity and and this reminds me a lot of uh, you know I've I've been involved in in causes and uh in in activism for a long time but in sean again every time we got bad news every time we got a bad court decision or you know bad news it was like this is not when we give up this is when we we dig in and in some ways right now we've been given a bit of good news bad news but good news from this bc hydro report which is we 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 haven't been incorrect the you know the 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 people that are opposed to site c and all of the evidence that has been brought forward is being confirmed. And so now is the time to really lean in. And it's, it's gonna take more than just Adam and me to do that. It's gonna take all of us and, and we need to build a, a, a bigger kind of effort on this, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm hopeful about uh, building a, a very different vision for the future of energy in British Columbia. Yeah, that's honestly almost probably what you said when you came to my class in grade four. I don't think you cared that we were nine and that we wouldn't understand anything, but I think we all appreciated the fact that we were treated like adults. And that kind of transitions into the next question, next two questions, actually. And the first one being, what do we think is the most important issues facing the youth of today? And the second being, how do we feel about going back to school? And I can I kind of answer the second one first. Personally, being of a person who is quite high risk, I cannot go back to school. And I'm very hasty to agree with the BC government's current decision because personally, I've been so connected in my school community over the past year. And it really hurts me to know that I would not be able to have the same teachers and that I would have to transfer to a brand new online school that I've never used before. And I know specifically in my district, Online teachers were given so little time to prepare for online school that it, the system was rushed and a lot of kids got left behind. And I think that if we focus on the time, focus the time on providing a really great online school experience while having those in person learning options, that'll be so much more enriching for students, especially the ones who can't go back to school. But of course, I don't think that that's the most important issue facing youth. It's a big one but I don't think a lot of youth care about school right now. Personally, I think what Harrison said about underrepresentation of youth in the parliament is essential. It's an essential statistic. That is why lowering the provincial voting age is so essential to me because there's so much research that shows that if you engage youth in politics earlier, they're more likely to vote for the rest of their lives. So giving 16 year olds and 17 year olds that power to vote is not just going to lead to a bunch of uneducated teenagers voting. It's gonna to lead to a bunch of uneducated teenagers empowered to educate themselves about our political system. And who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want an entire generation to be empowered to make change and to engage with the Green Party and to engage in the Canadian political space? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot, yeah, there are a lot of issues that are facing youth right now. Uh, obviously, the climate crisis is kind of the big looming one. Uh, but I feel like we have a lot of discussions about that. I don't know, it's kind of my, I'm a climate activist, that's my whole thing. I'm going to also talk a bit about the going back to school. I'm in a bit of a different situation than Grace. I'm going into my second year at Langara College. Um, and I've recently been talking with a lot of uh, young people my age who are, uh, in a really tough situation having to go back to school um, because not a single school has decreased their tuition. So everyone is still paying full tuition for their school. I'm talking to people who are in arts programs, film programs, trade school programs, and they're still having to pay full tuition for an online, some sort of online school that they don't even really know what it's going to look like. Um, and that tuition is coming after throughout the summer uh, and well throughout this whole pandemic youth have been youth especially post-secondary students have been pretty much ignored or mistreated um, so the CERB was kind of had a lot of holes in it one of the big holes was students 
Um, so the government decided to provide the Canada Emergency Student Benefit, which valued students at about 60% of other people, even though we're paying the same amount of rent. The same, we have added tuition costs, we're paying the same amount of money for food. Um, so that's left a lot of students in really, really tough financial situations, which was added on top of the fact that we're already in a place where we can barely afford housing in Vancouver. Like, it's insane. Uh, having to, I've re spent the past couple of months trying to find the place I'm going to live for September, and it's been a pretty crazy process because it is very, very expensive. Um, and yeah, I have to make a lot of sacrifices with the way I'm going to live just to be able to live in Vancouver still and be able to go to school. Um, and I don't really see at that changing anytime soon. Uh, the BC government hasn't done a great job of helping people with rent. The repayment programs that are coming into place are going to be quite difficult. There's not a whole, like, there is some action being taken on the housing crisis, but I'm still, as someone living in North Vancouver, the housing that's being built here is like affordable for their low income housing is affordable for people making $60,000. I'm like, when am I going to be making $60,000? I want to be a high school teacher. Like, that's going to take me two decades. Um, so, yeah, I think there are just so many financial issues that are facing young people right now. And I think that they're not being talked about enough in government. Um, yeah. So, you know, hearing from both of you, this is, you, you, you make the case yourselves, just in how you presented the information. You make the case for why we should be extending the vote to youth. Um, you are deeply engaged in your world and in the decisions that are being made, and you are able to articulate the impacts that they have on you. Um, and, you know, when I, I'm going to start with the schools because I'm not there. As you know, I've been a teacher. And, and Grace, your point is something that I've been raising and, and really questioning the, the reasoning behind the decision. And I actually find it quite um, challenging to hear the, the Minister of Education say, well, if students don't want to go back to school, uh, then they can sign up for online learning and through a, a distributed online learning program. There's, you know, one, it's very dismissive of of the range of reasons why students would not want to go back to school. And it, it, as exactly as you point out, it dismisses the role that your school community plays in your life and that that school community can continue to play that role in your life. Uh, if we adopt it, and this to me, it's a perfect solution. I'm trying to get it listened to, but you know, there are some teachers in schools who also feel for whatever reason, immune issues, uh, living with people with compromised immune systems, that they also don't want to go back into the classrooms. So why not match those teachers from the school with the students from the school who are feeling, you know, who are needing to, to do the online and then have the, the teachers and the students who are in the schools, recognizing that as the, the fall unfolds and we are going to encourage students not to go to school if they have any sign of a sore throat or a running nose, that those students can then seamlessly connect with their peers and teachers who are connected with the school community and not miss school because they're home with a cold or flu or heaven forbid with COVID, right? And so it creates a more uh, seamless and, and all-encompassing approach to, to the back to school. And so uh, I appreciate your perspective on this, Grace, and it really reinforces what I've been thinking about this. And, and Harrison, I've heard from, uh, from university students on the same thing. I actually asked this question of the advanced education minister, exactly this question about the tuition. And I think that, uh, you know, her, her response was, you know, universities and colleges are providing excellent uh, instruction and we need to value it. And I think that, again, without the, the, the input of young people and the reality informing how we're making these decisions and trying to understand the impacts of them, we cannot be making the best decisions that we need to be making. And so you, you both are uh, you know, just over and over proving why we need more youth 
uh, in the building, engage with people in the building, and part of the, the conversation. So I think we're going to uh, lead into a bit of a roundtable conversation uh, about resiliency and how do we build a resilient BC. And this is a topic, again, that's very close to my heart. Um, and it certainly became clear to me in Shawnigan that uh, you cannot undermine a community's drinking water source and expect that community to be able to be resilient. Uh, and then, of course, I think more deeply, and, and I think COVID has really highlighted this, that we, we have to get a, a lot more serious about resilience, that uh, the kind of uh, the impacts that this pandemic has had, and we know that there's more shocks coming. We know that the world is going to become increasingly uh, consistently experiencing these kinds of shocks, whether it's it's other pandemics and experts are saying that we've created the perfect conditions for for zoonotic diseases and we are seeing an uptick in the rate of zoonotic diseases showing up and so hiv aids uh, ebola h1n1 sars mers and now this and and what you can see in that is that they are arriving with shorter uh periods of time between the next outbreak and uh, you know, this is this COVID nineteen is a huge wake up call for all of us on that front. And and for me, it's like okay, I, I you know a year ago I made a chart about how do we create resilient communities, and at the at the core of it is the people. We have to know each other, we have to care about each other, and we have to to build our communities up from the people uh, upwards. But then we have to figure out how do we ensure we have water security? How do we ensure that we have food security? How do we build that energy resiliency so that an earthquake or a major storm is not undermining our capacity to get energy and electricity to, to people over the province? So I'm, I'm very keen to hear from, uh, from Harris and Grace on this. Yeah, I mean, Immediately when I think of resilience, specifically living in Victoria, BC, the homelessness crisis has become so evident, specifically at the beginning of the pandemic, when homeless shelters closed and everybody was on the streets. Immediately, people were faced with this kind of attitude of, oh, well, you shouldn't be out here. We're in a pandemic. You can't be out here. But there's no choice. People don't realize that there is no choice for these people and that every single resource that was given to them is completely gone. And instead of this being met with sympathy and resources, it was met with destructions of personal property and tents and every bit of living space that this person has. And there was many kind of band-aids that was placed on the situation. They were given short-term housing or a set amount of money, but none of it actually address the systemic issue that is within resiliency and how we can create a community that is resilient throughout these pandemics because with the climate crisis this is going to be happening so much more and on such a bigger scale yeah drawing this sort of into also what sonny was talking about before about like community and post-secondary uh so in post-secondary like a really key part for students as a whole to be able to respond to crises is the communities that exist on campus, whether it's the student unions, the clubs, whatever organizations are on campus, even just being able to like talk with your friends in person to be able to organize to respond to things. And we have lost so much of that right now in this crisis that it's a bit terrifying, like seeing some of the issues that are coming up just interesting issues around like the U passes, stuff like that, that just come up. And it's like, we need a student response to this, but it's almost impossible to be organizing this online when you can't actually, you aren't on the ground able to organize people to respond. Um, and yeah, I have that concern in almost every aspect of our society right now. It's coming with like climate change, we're the effects are gonna keep getting worse and worse. We're seeing the overdose crisis is just escalating. We've had the two record-breaking months in terms of overdose deaths. And the, where's the response been to that? We're sort of seem to be entering a second wave of COVID. We're having like the most new cases a day that we've had in like two or three months. 
Mm -hmm. Are we able to respond to that? Um, and I think that the way that we can really push um, government to respond is through that organizing on the ground, whether it's students, whether it's renters, workers, unions, communities. Um, but we've just lost a lot of that capacity right now. And I think that we should be doing whatever we can to strengthen those uh, institutions that are able to push back and provide resiliency when there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we have a couple of questions and the, the first one, Harrison, we're gonna put to you, which is what is one of the missing issues that you believe is not being addressed because of the lack of younger generation leaders in places of elected office? Oh, there are so many. Um, I mean, one that I would highlight is the conversations that are being had right now around policing. Um, so polls have recently come out that uh, the vast majority of young people, whether it's 60, 70 percent, um, support defunding the police. And these are the people who generally have the most experience on the ground dealing with police, who are actually like in the communities working with whether it's homeless communities, whether it's drug users, whether it's, um, I don't know, various communities. Um, and I think that the youth voice is pretty much being ignored. <laughs> Even if you look at um, the supposed people in our, um, like in the federal government who are supposedly progressives, most of them aren't even willing to push this issue to the forefront, even though it's supported by the vast, vast majority of young people. Mm -hmm. um, and also the conversations around racism is the same. Young people have so much more awareness of the issues that are happening around systemic racism. And um, yeah, it, they're, it's just largely being ignored by our politicians. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can say that as like from a, as a from a white settler perspective, I cannot speak on all of the intersections of racism that come up when talking about defunding the police. But specifically, it seems to be a theme with youth. We're told that it won't work. We're told that it's too bold or that it just is too far off in the future. And that is something we can think about after we do this or after we do that or after we boost the economy. And there are so many places across the world that have shown it does work and it works better than our current system. And being involved in the activism community, there is tons of issues faced with police. And I just saw a message in the chat, the time is now. <laughs> there is no time to wait because the levels of police violence are only increasing and there's no sign of stopping that. And pushing for this now and having our governments realize that this is an issue we're not going to shut up about is essential. And I think the next big question that has come up quite a lot is, how is youth engagement going to get the Greens more seats? And I'd like to see, Harrison, what do you think about that? Uh, well, there are a lot of youth movements out there who have a lot of power right now, um, but who are also very skeptical of politics and government. Um, being a part of the climate strike movement, we got about 150,000 people to the streets of Metro Vancouver. That's a pretty massive voting block who are following young people right now. Um, but a lot of my fellow activists are, they're skeptical of every party um, and any politician because they, their experiences interacting with politics have been very negative. Um, so I think getting like, if the, if the Green Party starts showing with a leader like Sonia that they are listening to young people, that just brings in a massive, massive block of youth activists who are currently not, like a lot, most of them are staying home. They aren't out there voting um, and bringing them in can bring in their parents and grandparents as someone just mentioned in the chat. Um, but I think that there's no one right now who's really reaching out to those people and really listening to them other than a few people within the Green Party. Um, so I think doubling down on that, bringing those people in, showing them that they're important is going to be massive for the future of the Greens. Yeah, I think every single person on this event knows that the Greens are the boldest party and we're the bravest party. So how come we're not the youngest party? Because 
that kind of voice speaks to young people. And the reason why young people are so apprehensive of political parties is because there have not been safe spaces for young people. Mm. And in order to get that huge voting block that will get the Greens so many more seats, we have to actually prove ourselves and say, we are a safe space and you'll actually be listened to. We're not going to tokenize you. We're not going to use you for photo ops. We're not going to use your voice to make us look good. We're going to make you an integral part of our positions and our policy. I just, you know, one of the things, as, as both of you talk about the cynicism that you're seeing amongst young people around political parties, around politics generally, and politicians, you know, I, I, I reflect on this quite a bit because it's, it's, uh, it's very dangerous uh, that we have become very cynical about generally. I mean, generally, like there's this uh, uh, kind of poll out there that like politicians are considered right there, down there around, you know, used card sales people in terms of trustworthiness. And when I have brought people in and, and, and young people and I brought in when there have been school groups, I always ask, like, because obviously question period is the thing that most people see as part of their experience in the legislature. And I say, well, how, how was that to, to watch? And everybody is aghast. I mean, they are just astonished that, you know, here are these adults yelling at each other across the room, shouting each other down, trying to score political points in the worst way possible. And one thing that we have made a, a commitment to as Greens is that we don't treat question period that way. We, our questions are always about issues and policy and often with a, a solution or an idea embedded into it. Like, here you go, have you thought of this, right? And they can be sharp about the issue, but we are never making personal attacks on, on individuals. And I think that we have to be very mindful of how delicate and how precious democracy is, how quickly, and I would look south of us right now, how quickly it can suddenly uh, disappear. It's, it's, democracy is not the, the status quo of how um, societies have been governed through most of history. Democracy is new, it's fragile. And so uh, this is one of the, the burdens that I feel as an elected person is that I really want to counter that whole uh, stereotype, that narrative about politicians, this notion that we, we uh, you know, put partisanship first and that everything is about winning at all costs. And I think that that is uh, deeply dangerous to, to democracy. It's deeply dangerous to our society. And so I, I'm intending as you say, Grace, I think a safe place is a place where you, you aren't going to be subject to uh, being yelled at or being discounted or being called names or being, uh, you know, not listened to because the, the only way we make real change is if we are all actually making it together. And this is one of the things that you know, in the legislature, I have built friendships with people in both of the other parties, like friendships. We're going to be friends for, hopefully, for the rest of our lives. People that I admire and, and look to. And those relationships then can result in outcomes that start to do this, the, this thing where we, we stop focusing all of our effort and energy on these outside edges where we disagree so much and we start focusing our energy and efforts on the things that we all agree need urgent action urgent work and we're going to to push those through together and so you know i've i've spent my whole life been told being told i i dream impossible dreams but uh this is to me it's not an impossible dream it's a necessary dream the times that we are in require a different kind of politics than the kinds that are being presented to us right now. And we have to, to make those politics differently, we have to start with ourselves and do it differently. All right, so the next question we have uh, in Grace is how each of us would run things if we were in the legislature. Quite a big question. <laughs> wow, um, I think a couple things come to mind. Um, 
I know specifically what we've kind of built in the climate activist movement is realizing that fighting the issues and creating solutions is more important than simply partisanship and that opposition does not mean that we cannot achieve consensus and that we can't fix these worldwide issues that we don't have to just say oh we're green we're not going to agree with anybody else that we won't come down from our standpoints we just want to be able to make that change that is our goal and we have to realize that and i think through realizing that we can also create a safer space and kind of build those bridges to show that we're looking for everybody's voice not just the voices that a hundred percent agree with, with with us all the time because that creates a pretty toxic space where we feel like we can't speak up for ourselves and we can't say hey this is not right and we we cannot do this alone we have to make change now and we can't just try to create conflict all the time instead of creating safe spaces and it's going to sound kind of cheesy but also just having a lens of compassion through everything we do understanding that everybody's coming from their own place everyone has their own life experiences and has their own separate belief system and that is just as valid as anybody else's belief system and that if we have that compassion and kind of bring everybody together we can create a really safe space where everyone's really excited about the ideas we're bringing together that we're not just being very procedural and being very like chosen we have to be flexible and we have to be adaptable and we have to be able to create the space we want to see and not just keep the space we have right now yeah my answer to that um i think there's two really clear things to me one is making decisions based on evidence um, and a crucial part of that for me is listening to the people who have more experience and knowledge than me. Um, so there's one quote that I really like from Garth Mullins, who's a, a, act, a drug user activist, um, which is nothing about us, no, nothing about us without us. So I think that if I was in government and I was making a decision about any issue, I would be going to the people who are most affected by it. If I'm making a decision that would have, that, about Indigenous peoples, I'm listening to the Indigenous people. If the, what they're saying is different than my personal belief, I'm going to follow them on that. And mm -hmm. it's the same for every issue, homelessness, opioid crisis, the climate crisis. I don't claim to be an expert on any of those things, but I have people who are experts and I would go to them and ask them. Um, and the second which kind of ties into that is just having people to hold me accountable um i think that that's pretty much the most important thing and something that a lot of politicians seem to be lacking is people who are really going to call them out if they're doing something stupid um and gonna stand up to them and really say hey this is stupid you're doing this wrong um and also just actually listening to that if someone is who you trust is saying you're do, doing something wrong, really listening to them, rethinking your personal beliefs and views. Um, yeah, so those are the two main things for me. I just want to, I, I want to respond to things that both of you said. And Grace, when you talked about making change, how we create change, and you talked about compassion, I'm going to add to that joy and love. I, I remember the first time as an area director in Shawnigan, it would have been around 2015, the first time I made a decision that I was going to stand up in front of a crowd of a couple hundred people as an elected politician and talk about love and say that to a, to a community in crisis um, where we were, we were, we hated using the word fight. So we would always try our very best to say we were standing up for the future that we wanted. So we were standing up for the future that we wanted and it included safe drinking water for our, our community and for our future generations. And it became so clear to me early on in that, that anger was not going to be what sustained us. Hatred was not going to sustain us. Being mad at people, blaming people was not going to sustain us. And so what we needed to be able to sustain us was compassion and kindness and joy and love. 
And so built into all of our efforts, we didn't just get together to protest or we didn't just get together to strategize what we were doing next or just get together to write letters. We got together for beer and burger nights. We got together for galas. We got together for community celebrations. We got together to buy a mountain in the midst of it all, right? And we infused what we did with compassion and then extended that to the people that we were supposedly in, in opposition to, right? And so every time the Minister of Environment, Mary Polak, would do what we were asking her to do, whether it was come and meet with me or have a meeting in the community or, you know, react to whatever evidence we were putting in front of her, we would publicly thank her and we would say, you know, the minister did this, we so appreciate it, we're so grateful. And then we would say, and what, we, what we'd like her to do next is this. And what that meant was that when I got in the legislature and the first time I passed Mary Polak in the hallway, we were fine, right? It wasn't like, uh-oh, I can't, I better not, I better not because that's my enemy. There was no enemy. We were just standing up for the future we wanted. And, we, and the thing I say to any activist or any community that's working with this is, Every single person is your potential ally. Treat everybody that way. And so, Grace, I just wanted to amplify what you said. And Harrison, evidence, and I think one of our, one of our challenges as a party, and something that we all have to work on, is that we, we have to learn to meet people where they're at. So we like to talk about how we're evidence-based and how, you know, we, we were, and, and I'm really proud of that. This is, this is really important that we look at, we are not, I, I like the fact that we're not ideological, right? Although we will be perceived that way. But it's not enough to be right in our own minds. And I think that our, our, our job to expand our, our green umbrella, our green tent, is to spend more time meeting people where they're at, instead of telling people where they should be or where we are and how right we are, we have to find a way to, to bridge the, these gaps that people might feel. And, and we also have to look at ourselves critically, as you say, and, and politics is a weird place. It, it does strange things to people. And when you say uh, you need people to hold you accountable, I have people I love dearly from, you know, my husband, my family, but also, you know, Christina and Jillian and Maeve, and they have strict instructions <laughs> to like, tell me what I need to hear and not let me lose that thread of who I, who I am and that I'm just a regular person like everybody else. And Maeve, I love this about Maeve, she has a, a word and then I know I've, I've, got to, I've got to be ready for what's coming. She'll say, dude. And then I know, okay, I'm ready. What do I need to hear? And she, she, she will say it with love and kindness. And it's my job to hear that as, a, as an elected person. Because we, we tend to get in these bubbles where everybody around us wants to make us feel that we're right. And that's the wrong thing for us to, we wanna be always asking, how do I do better? What did I do wrong? Where do we go next? So I just wanted to respond to both of you on that. Yeah, I'd say that very, that kind of constructive criticism and that where we go next mentality kind of really ties into our next question. And the question is, how do you see racism being connected with specific types of racism, such as racism towards indigenous peoples? And is there an underlying framework? And I think obvious, the obvious statement is that we're all from a settler colonial background and I don't think any of us understand every single intersection of racism and oppression that affects people currently. And there are so many different types of racism, some systemic, and it is so deeply rooted in our society that of course there's an underlying framework that Canada is essentially built on a colonial state that is made from the literal and cultural genocide of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. You can't get away with that by just apologizing. And I'd like, so Sonia, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, this is, this is the conversation and the action for our times is one to, to really come to terms with. And, and I, I was recently, uh, the Couch and Intercultural Society put together an event um, promoting uh, equity and anti-racism in our community. And, and they're gonna create working groups so that we can all keep coming together. And of course, it was a Zoom gathering like this, and it was almost all white women my age. And, you know, okay. So there's, there's, there's a starting point that we have to look at and, and try to understand. But then the conversation, and I think it was a really valuable one, uh, was, okay, what is our work, right? Where do we start? Because being privileged, being white, uh, means that, as you say, Grace, like we, we are unable to, to really deeply understand what a, a lived experience of relentless day-to-day -day racism feels like. Um, and so the, the work that we have to do as individuals on this is enormous. And I think that it's heartening for me to see how much I, the people around me and are leaning into this. Um, and the work for us as an organization is also enormous. And I read an article, I don't know if you saw it, it was in the Times Columnist last weekend, and it was a, a, a writer on, um, on Salt Spring Island talking about the environmental movement has typically been a, a, a white privileged movement. Um, and that we have, to, uh, we have to come to terms with that. And so what he was talking about was on Salt Spring that there was this uh, effort to stop affordable housing because of the, the worries about, you know, adding more people and, and impacts to the environment. And we absolutely need to merge together um, justice, equity, and environmentalism. And they, they, are, they are in the real world, they are merged. Uh, environmental impacts, climate impacts happen more to people in developing world in the poorest parts of the world. They happen more to people who are poor in wealthy countries. Uh, the impacts of uh, inequality are, uh, you know, so significant and it, it undermines all of us. It's not, you know, the interesting thing about the studies about inequality is the greater there is inequality and the greater there is racism, actually everybody in that society is less happy. So when you decrease inequality and when you actively work on anti-racism, everybody benefits. And it's not just like, oh, we're gonna benefit people who are suffering from inequality or are suffering from racism. We all benefit from that work. And so it's, 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 it is the work of our time right now. Yeah, it's really, racism is tied in with almost every crisis that we're facing right now. And uh, Indigenous people, Black people, people of color are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis, by COVID-19, by the opioid crisis, by homelessness, by housing, by economic inequality. Um, but it also goes the other way as well, that racism is at the root of a lot of those crises. So if we're working to solve racism or to at least take some action to push back against it, we are contributing to fighting those crises as well. Mm -hmm. And um, definitely within the climate movement, it's been very interesting within the youth climate movement. It's again, yeah, largely a white settler movement. Um, and we've definitely had a number of experiences where um, Indigenous people, Black people were treated quite horribly, like at climate strikes by climate activists. Um, and we've had to take a lot of steps to make our actions safe spaces for people of color. Um, and it's just taken a lot of work. And really, I think the biggest thing is just that is recognizing that it's not the role of indigenous people, black people, people of color to solve this. It's the role of white people to solve this and settlers to solve this. This is our problem to deal with. Um, and if we're asking them to do work to help us solve it, we need to make sure that they're being compensated for that because it really is not their crisis to solve. Um, 
So yeah. All right, so leading into our next roundtable discussion. Um, so this is about just building the future of the BC Green Party. Shall yeah. I start? Or are you going to start? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think Harrison's last point really ties into this because I know largely the mentality in most political spaces right now are, oh, well, if you didn't bring up the problem, it clearly wasn't a problem. But the amount of times I know I have faced aggression and other youth have faced aggression in political spaces where we haven't had the position to bring it up and say, hey, by the way, um, no one's listening to us or we're not being respected because of our age or we're not even being listened to because of our age. Mm -hmm. it, it's, we're not, it's not in our capacity to bring that up and to say, hey, what's happening? It's the job of other people and bystanders to recognize their own behavior and also to bring out the goodness and everybody, because everybody is coming from a place of that joy that the Greens have kind of fostered. We just have to stand up for everything that's happening in the party. Say mm -hmm. that, hey, that's not okay when somebody says something racist, homophobic, ageist, transphobic, and mm -hmm. create a culture where marginalized peoples aren't afraid to join in in conversation because they aren't going to be listened to or because they're going to be yelled at. And specifically with ageism in the party, it's essential to realize that age and life experience create two totally different things, that age is just a number, and that's said a lot, but I think realistically it is. I know some 10-year-olds who can speak way more eloquently than anybody else I know, and that is because they've had that insane amount of life experience that I just can't even fathom. And realizing that what I said before, everyone's coming from a different place and that if we take everybody where they're at and listen to them and discover what they can bring first before making assumptions, then the party is going to be such a better place. Harrison, do you want to add? I have some things to say, but I'll hear yours first and then I'll, I'll jump in. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think that there's so much space for the BC Green Party right now within British Columbia politics. It's kind of hilarious to watch the NDP and the Liberals sometimes just kind of going back and forth. Like I was seeing the other day, a couple of Liberals were attacking the NDP for not doing enough to solve like homelessness and the opioids crisis, which was the exact same thing the NDP were attacking the Liberals for when they were in government. Um, and neither of them is really listening to even like Dr. Bonnie Henry's recommendations on those things. Um, so I think there's just so much space in BC politics right now for a party who's actually going to listen to experts on all these crises and is actually going to push for solutions rather than just attacking people for not doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that that's one of the main reasons I'm so excited to see Sonia um, I, like taking on this leadership role because um, I do think in the past the Green Party has had some struggles with uh, really being evidence-based on all of these things and not attacking the other parties but also being really bold with the solutions that we're presenting. Um, yeah. Okay so I've got a couple things I want to respond to both of you. So Grace when you said 10 year olds um, it reminded me I just yesterday came across I was looking through an old Shawnigan Focus uh, newspaper so it's our community newspaper and th there was an article in there that Christina was referencing um, that I that was involving some work I'd done but I found this letter in there and it said parents are way 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 too overprotective and then the byline was Peter Salmon that's my kid nine years old so five years ago, Peter wrote this letter about how parents have to be less overprotective and trust their kids. And then he talked about how, you know, my mom, my parents let me bake when they're home. They let me ride my bike except on the busy road, right? And he put things in parentheses. He said, so I guess my parents are okay. So I asked him about this and he said, yeah, I was really upset with you because you, you wouldn't let me ride my bike on the busy road. I'm like, so you wrote a, an article in the local paper <laughs> It's like, yeah. So um, yes, let's not underestimate life experience and, and youth in any ways. And I, in terms of diversifying candidates, I saw Stephanie's uh, comment in there because I know that this was a question that came up in a, in, in a town hall 
a while ago and and I was asked about what what would be my plan for how does our party diversify candidates I'm going to give a quick story on on something related to this and then give you my plan uh, when we brought in electoral reform in 2017 everyone focused on banning big money you know, you know from provincial politics but another piece of legislation was municipal uh, electoral reform and that included limiting to $1,200 the donations to any municipal candidate, um, which was a big change because pr prior to that legislation, you could donate any amount of money to your own campaign or to somebody else's campaign municipally. So we applied the same, the same uh, restrictions on, on campaign donations, which me meant that people couldn't, what had happened in a lot of small towns, and it, what was interesting was in the speeches in the house, a number of MLAs of a certain gender stood up and said, well, I don't think that's fair because when I ran for local government, I just can't, I just financed my whole campaign myself. I paid for it myself and then I was elected. And so that it should, you should be allowed to do that. And uh, there was some, uh, some wavering in our caucus, but I really pushed on this, how important I felt that, that we stuck to this. And so there was an amendment put on the floor to, to, to raise that amount from 1,200 um, to 10,000 and then, or to 5,000 and, and we stuck by it and we stuck with the 1,200. And so what did this do? The next election, the, the municipal election, going to UBCM before the election with the campaign rules, the, the, the crowd is a sea of people of a certain age. And then after that election, where the campaign limit was $1,200, uh, it meant that the playing field had been leveled. And I, I went to UBCM the next year, and it is a sea of young people, a sea of diverse people, a sea of women. Mayors, like towns that have never had women as mayors, elected women as mayors because the, the, the field had been leveled. And it, it meant that we got a way more diverse representation at the municipal level. Just that change to the election act. So that's an example of how legislation and, and policy can change things. How are we going to get more diverse candidates? We have to change how we approach this. So how we've approached it as a party typically is, here's the bar. You get over the bar as a candidate and then you know you'll get more and more support we have to if we are going to elect diverse candidates we have to be determined to support those candidates and not expect that every candidate can can achieve the same things the same way that a privileged wealthy candidate can do with a, a, a network that that may not be accessible to other people. And if we want those diverse voices, and boy, do we need diverse voices in the legislature, then we have to approach how we get candidates, how we support candidates entirely differently. And that's how we're going to change the landscape inside our party and inside the legislature. Yeah, so building a little bit on just the conversation of what the BC Greens need to do to get bring in the voters who are going to like all those voters who are currently um, like not interested in politics, don't trust politicians. How do we bring them in? Um, one thing I wanted to just mention briefly is that I think a big part of it is have just having more voices at the table, showing. I mean, obviously. Grace and I are both white, but uh, we are providing the young voice. This is the BC Greens showing that young people are important to them. And we both have pretty big networks of youth who we know who we can be bringing into the party. So I think the pretty much the most important thing to do is to be reaching out to the communities that we want, that the Greens want supporting us, not reaching out asking for their support, but reaching out, asking how the BC Greens can help them. And that's really like my first experience, big experience with Sonia was asking her for help and her providing that help for me. It wasn't her asking for me, me to support her. Um, and because of that, when the request came, her asking me to support her, it was a no brainer. 
Um, and I think that that's really the approach we should be taking with every community. Uh, yeah. And Grace, do you have any thoughts on this too? Yeah. I mean, I know Sonia often mentions meeting people where they're at. And that is such an essential thing right now. Like, I know specifically when I was nine years old, Sonia came to speak to my class and she didn't care that I was some nine year old. She had a genuine conversation with me about the Site C Dam and all of these high level things that definitely went over my head at the time. But they kind of made me think, hey, maybe there is a place for me and I do want to learn about this. So why do I have to stay on the sidelines just because I'm so young? And until I kind of got up into like youth member age, like I am now 14, it's really hard to get involved in the party before that. And there are so many young people who want to be engaged, but there's no avenues to do that. Mm -hmm. And creating conversations through schools, through younger people, getting them engaged, we can get them telling their parents. I remember I came home from that talk and I think I went on an entire rant about the sights you damned to my parents and they kind of just said, I know Grace, I know. And you know, we're kind of surprised that their nine-year-old was talking about climate statistics, but it made me feel listened to and it made me feel like I could genuinely do whatever. And that passion did obviously stay with me. And I think addressing the systemic factors in the BC Green set keep, keep out marginalized voices, such as not having those avenues for young voices or having a non-diverse slate of candidates really prevents people from thinking that they do have a place because it is very easy to get discouraged. Mm -hmm. I remember I had some experiences with the NDP and I kind of swore off politics. I was like, nope, this is not for me. I am not treated well. I am not listened to or respected. I am just going to stay away. I don't like this. This is something that doesn't need to happen in my life. But that kind of, that switch flipped where I realized, well, if I'm feeling like this, aren't other people feeling like this? And how do I like flip that switch where people can say, hey, how do I make other people feel comfortable? And how do we all make everybody feel comfortable in these spaces? And building the BC Greens in a way where there's avenues for young people to get involved. Diverse, pe marginalized groups don't feel like they are being oppressed within a system that doesn't want to oppress them. Mm -hmm and breaking down every single systemic barrier the BC Greens has created. Mm -hmm. Yep, the, the becoming a more welcoming, uh, a more welcoming space is, is essential to, to moving forward. And, and Sherry, I did see your comment about, it's been this way back to Athens, but I, I'll, I'm just gonna add that um, I have a long history of being told that things can't be achieved and then we've achieved them. So uh, <laughs> I think one, we have to dream the dream. And then two, we just start making it real at whatever level we can. And we just, we, you know, I, I in, in the election race in Cowichan in 2017, it literally was built on conversations around kitchen tables for months with small groups of people. And that slowly built up into more and more support because they would tell other people and they would tell other people and, and we, you know, it, we were told over and over, it's not possible for you to win in this riding. And, and we did it and we campaigned, literally, we said it all the time, we campaigned with love in our hearts. We campaigned to build community, not tear it down. And I think that we can continue to show this uh, at a provincial level. And I, I see Christina wants us to segue, and I think this is really important into, into resource-based towns and how do we, how do we how do we connect with communities that are you know experiencing the 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 impacts from uh, this long time belief that you know BC we are the hewers of wood and the miners of stone you know that that we just dig things out of the ground or cut them down and that's what our economy is based on well, number one and as Harrison pointed out evidence is is not on the side of that so. Forestry, mining, oil and gas altogether account for 5% of uh, GDP uh, in, in the province and fewer than 5% of jobs. And so, so one, we, you know, it's, that's one piece of it, that's the evidence. But for the people for whom these are the jobs and for the communities that are dependent on the jobs, we really do need to have a vision 
uh, for a future that that works. And you know, I live, I grew up on an acreage, well, half in Edmonton, half on acreage. Lived here in Victoria for 20 years, and for the last 10 years, I've been up in Shawnigan Lake. And I understand the pull of both the urban and the small town, but the small town. The smaller community is a wonderful place to be, to raise a family. And we don't want to lose these towns and these communities that have been fundamentally resource-based and we have to find. And one of the, one of the avenues is, is when we, we look at the models where the resources aren't being shipped out raw, right? So uh, Herat Proctor Community Forest is a great example of this where the forest is a community forest, it's managed for a number of values, including climate resiliency, watershed protection, recreation, but also for local economy. And those, the, the timber from that forest goes to a value added, you know, timber frame manufacturing. It goes back into the community where jobs are created from that. So number one, we have to stop being the, you know, as Adam puts it, the, the resource colony where our resources are stripped and shipped. Uh, but number two, we have to envision the, the new economy and, and the regional clean energy economy is one that creates jobs all over the province and creates sustainable long-term jobs. And this is something that we should really be leaning into. I'll turn it over to, uh, to Harrison. Yeah, um, I definitely think for a lot of these communities, rural and indigenous communities, the key thing is giving them ownership and power over what's happening. So not sending in massive corporations to exploit their town and exploit their labor, but giving them ownership and power over what's happening, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's more sustainable forestry industry, whether it's those more downstream um, things that Sonia was talking about. Um, yeah, I think it's just really important that it's that these decisions are being made not only with the idea of, hey, we'll send in a corporation to give them jobs, but that it's really in the hands of the community what they want to be doing with their labor and with their land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I'm going to definitely tie back in the kind of compassion piece and meeting people where they're at. It is just so important in every aspect of what we do and creating that just transition for workers where we're not just saying okay everyone has to move to green energy jobs and suddenly we're in this huge transitional slump where people aren't able to get the training they need to get into these jobs because they can't afford to take the time off work and we're seeing that a lot with COVID-19 people being stuck in these situations where their jobs are being phased out however in order to get the training or experience they need for these newer greener jobs they can't support their families and i know a couple months ago we saw the logging crisis specifically up in port mcneil where families were really struggling and there were no avenues to create the logging industry greener and to say we really want to phase out the logging industry as we see it today but we also don't want to leave everybody behind. And that is why creating a just transition program for workers is the first thing we need to do. Because if we don't do that, we're going to see thousands of families completely left behind by systems that weren't built to transition to that green energy system. And it, it is systemic, but we can break down that systemic barrier and create a system where workers are subsidized to take this training. They're not left high and dry in order to create sustainable a sustainable future. And if we show that we are going to meet people where we're at and that when we create these programs, workers are not going to have to put their families in jeopardy, I guarantee they're going to be more flexible with transitioning to this greener future because I don't think anybody wants to be stuck in a climate crisis. I just have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm ready to be declared obsolete really quickly here. <laughs> I'm ready to pass the baton. Like, this is such a, this whole evening to me is, to, and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not surprised. I, I know Harrison and Grace and, and I'm, I think that it's, it's incredible to hear them articulate what I don't hear being articulated inside the BC legislature. I, it's incredible that 
the, 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 the capacity to see the world so clearly and so compassionately and, and with such hope and understanding of, of not only where we need to get to, but how we can get there. Um, it, it is a testament to exactly what this evening was meant to be about, which is to say we need to put youth right in the center of, of this party, of our politics, of, of how we make decisions. Uh, and, and, you know, there's no way in the world that I could have effectively conveyed what the two of these two incredible young people have conveyed tonight. It's, uh, I, I, I think all of you must be as impressed as I am, but I'm impressed with them every single time I see and speak with them. And, and I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to share that with all of you tonight. It, uh, it's, it's been a, a, you know, I'm looking at the time and I'm, I'm slowly wrapping things up and I'm gonna give them the last word, but um, it's, been a, it's been a real gift and, a, and I'm so grateful to both of you for saying yes to this idea. And uh, you're not, it's Hotel California, you two. You're, you're not going home, you're never leaving. <laughs> you are very much permanent parts of the team and we need to grow this team uh, with your help uh, and with your peers if we are going to, to do the things that we so urgently need to do. Harrison, do you want to? Yeah, well, yeah, thank you so much, Sonia. It's really, it's really been a pleasure to be part of this. And um, yeah, I just have so much excitement for what could happen. It's easy to feel quite pessimistic and depressed in these times that we're going through. Um, but I really have just so much excitement for what the Green Party can achieve with you as leader. And um, yeah, I'm here to stay, here to be a part of it. Um, yeah, I'll pass it off to Grace. Yeah, to I, I have to reiterate, thank you so much, Sonia. It is so rare, honestly, to get this platform to be able to share the kind of youth voice that we've been feeling. It is very few and far between. And I know straight up, I have to say, if you're not registered as a member, what are you doing? It doesn't even have to be partisan. It is the knowledge that you have the direct effect on creating who might be our next premier. It is a transformative change that we can completely make ourselves and everyone has such an amazing impact and registering to vote is just so insane. And I'm so happy that being a youth member, I actually vote because that is so rare to see, have a voting age as low as 14. And I'm so happy to be able to uplift the voices of my fellow youth in doing this and to share Sonia's amazing message. You can register to vote without becoming a member too, if you're really opposed to that. You can be a supporter. Um, and if you are a supporter, uh, this, is, this is when it starts to count. There is a leadership race on and we need your support and we need you to, to get the word out about why uh, you're supporting our leadership campaign. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, she has her camera off. I think I want her to turn the camera on for a moment, Christina, if you would. Uh, because we haven't been highlighting this amazing young woman. And I, she's going to object to me calling her young, but for me, she's very young compared to me. And uh, Christina has been just extraordinary. And people have been saying to me, Oh, Sonia, you know, how are you doing this? You've got the legislative session, you've got your constituents, you've got a campaign. I'm like, I have this incredible team and it's being led by Christina and she is doing the most amazing job and I love her so. And uh, I just, I, I can't even begin to express how grateful I am. And you all need to make Christina very happy by making sure that our campaign is successful. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. And yes, everybody, that would make me very, very happy if we make our campaign successful. What I've done for you all is I've put the voter registration links and the support Sonia links into the chat. So if you know anybody who you want to convert to be a Sonia supporter immediately, please send them that support Sonia link. They can sign up as a direct supporter. But this is also about growing our movement. We really, really, really want to make sure that we grow the party, that we prepare for the next election. 
I know that under Sonia's leadership, we're ready. We're ready. We've got teams across the province. We have amazing candidates that were lined up, ready to go. And we know that we need to be ready to run. So it's time. It's time to grow the party. Please share the links with all of your contacts. If you'd like to sign up to volunteer, go to sonyafirstnow.ca. We would love to have you on the team. Thank you. And thank you, Sonia. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Harrison, Grace, and Christina. And uh, let's, let's go change the world together. <laughs> <laughs>